Then they, Robbie Zhao, because Robbie is on his way to Japan, uh, he's going there to teach for two weeks, which we're really excited for. So you are stuck with the um, inferior R, myself. We have a very special um, presenter today, and I'd like Montez to unmute himself and tell us a little bit about yourself. I am uh, Mu'taz Hassan, having uh, the pleasure to introduce my uh, first case uh, today. I am a nephrologist from uh, the south region of Saudi Arabia, originally from Egypt. Uh, and uh, this uh, case today, I hope it will uh, gain, uh, gain the, the advantage to be introduced for such marvelous community in CB Saudi. Thank you so much. Are you a Mo Salah fan? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. Okay, so who who is scribing and who is doing the teaching points? I am scribing. Oh, Andrea, um, how are you? Good. And I'll be doing teaching points today. Ibrahim, fantastic. I, I, Robbie and I actually got to see Andrea at SGIM recently in Denver, and it was so nice to see her. We had our little CP Solvers mini reunion there. But why don't we go ahead and switch to the whiteboard? And Moatez, as you're presenting, please pay attention to the whiteboard and make sure they're capturing it. If they're not capturing it, then just slow down a little bit, okay? Okay. Thank you. Can so we whenever, stop? Yeah, yes, please. Okay, today we will present uh, a case of uh, 39 years old male uh, with progressive complaint of uh, coughing blood with mild shortness of breath. And what is, we can just stop right there for a second, because I think this is such an important teaching point I'd like to make. Right away, we can frame this case as hemoptysis. Yes, the patient has shortness of breath, but the more specific abnormality here is literally they're coughing up blood. So immediately, one important thing comes to mind. You have to classify the degree of hemoptysis. Are we dealing with a whole cupful and massive hemoptysis? Or is this just a small amount of scant blood with cough? The reason this is critical, and it pains me to say this, but sometimes management is more important than diagnostic reasoning. If this is massive hemoptysis, I'm already thinking, do I need to give any products to reverse the tendency to bleed? Do I need to involve my interventional radiologist for an embolization, the CT surgeon for some type of intervention? Do I need to intubate the patient? So massive versus mild hemoptysis has critical implications in terms of next steps in management. And one other thing that I think it's important to know is that right away you want imaging in this patient because you want to see where the pathology is that's driving the hemoptysis. Because if this ends up being massive hemoptysis and the lesion is on the right side, you want to lay them down on that right side. Because if you lay them down on the left side, what happens? Gravity is going to pull that blood and it's going to disseminate to the other lung. We'll talk more about diagnosis later, but I really wanted to just briefly highlight the importance of quantifying the degree of hemoptysis, which has immediate management implications. So, Montez, why don't you give us more information? And I promise to talk about some diagnosis too. Okay, for uh, past, uh, past medical history for the patient, uh, the patient is having history of renal transplantation 23 years ago. Uh, there is no documentation regarding the etiology of chronic kidney disease for the patient. 
was on triple immunosuppressive therapy steroid tacrolimus MMF for 17 years. Unfortunately, chronic allograft nephropathy occurred and peritoneal dialysis started. Peritoneal dialysis for three years stopped because of frequent tank of catheter malfunction that ended with development of encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis that treated with uh, stopping the peritoneal dialysis and steroid tamoxifen courses. What was after that capsulitis, please? Encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. Got it. So there was some uh, sclerosis there. Fantastic. And Montes, did you want me to comment here or did you want to flush out the rest of the past medical, meds, social? Okay, we can proceed. Hemodialysis started five years ago. Uh, regarding medication, patient is on sinacalcid. Sivilamir, carbonate, brednisilone, tamoxifen, darbibutin. For family history, patient father is hypertensive, diabetic with single kidney. Regarding social history, patient is ex-smoker, retired soldier with no exposure to recreational drugs. Health-related behavior, he is retired soldier and uh, risk factor with smoking shisha, some, some uh, famous, famous uh, uh, type of smoking here, shisha. Which is not the name of Umaima's cat, I was taught. <laughs> Maybe the same, yes. Uh, I think Maybe I can comment here. This is this is really helpful. It really helps frame this case. And we can go right back to the HPI because the problem we're trying to solve here is hemoptysis. And you need to step back for two reasons. One is, do we really know that we're dealing with hemoptysis? On the grand scheme, Yes, we are dealing with hemoptysis, but just as an exercise, it's important to do this. This is blood per orum. So when someone is coming with blood coming out of their mouth, you need to know, are you dealing with a GI pathology, an oropharynx pathology, or a lung pathology? Here, the cough zooms in in the lung. This is most likely dealing with the lung pathology, though you can easily imagine someone with gastric bleeding may aspirate into the lung and then cough up the blood from the lung, right? but this is most likely dealing with the lung, but you even have to zoom out more. So you're, let's say we are really dealing with bleeding as opposed to something that might mimic bleeding, like the curran jelly sputum of some infectious processes. Whenever you're dealing with bleeding, you, this, it doesn't matter if it's GI bleeding, petechial bleeding, bleeding into the skin, bleeding in the lung, you need to know what the coagulation status and the platelet status of the host is. So right away, this patient who comes to the ED, I'm sending a CBC to look for the platelet. I'm sending a PT and I'm sending a PTT. And in this particular patient who has a history of CKD is on dialysis, I need to send a BMP or renal panel because we know uremia can impair the function of the platelet. So anyone who comes in with bleeding, Ask the question, is there something that is making them vulnerable to bleeding or not? And that will help you tremendously. Now let's zoom in on the lungs. So whenever you have hemoptysis, I want you to imagine you have the alveoli 
by the way, this Starbucks cup is going to be helpful for me all day today. And you have the alveoli, and then you have the vessels that are running along it, right? Hemoptysis, by definition, means that there's an abnormal connection here. There's an abnormal connection, some form of pathology. And this can come in two flavors. Either something's actually happening at the level of the alveoli, that's where the problem is, or something is happening at the level of the vessel. That's the easiest way to think about hemoptysis that I was uh, taught by Robbie, and I think it's brilliant. So if we're dealing with an alveolar process, it should show up on imaging. And that's why your first step, once you know the patient is stable for hemoptysis, is chest imaging. Because if the chest imaging shows a lot of pathology, then you know you're probably dealing primarily with an alveolar process. And then you can start thinking about stuff like pneumonia, cancers, any type of mass that might exist in the lung. But if the imaging is negative, then you got to start thinking about the vessel. And here's the beauty of it, folks. Even with the vessel, you could break it down into artery, capillary, and venules. You see how simple reasoning is when you step back and you just take an anatomical approach? At the level of the artery, pulmonary embolism can lead to hemoptysis. At the level of the capillaries, you can have capillaritis or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. At the level of the veins, anything that backs up pressure from heart failure to pulmonary hypertension can lead to hemoptysis. So if I were to summarize it here, any problem with bleeding, see if they're able to clot appropriately the platelets, the PT, PTT. When you have blood per aura, don't anchor on hemoptysis, but in this case with the cough, it's highly suggestive. And when you're dealing with hemoptysis, say, is there something in the lung which you're going to have to get imaging for? Or is it at the level of the vessel, which you might have to do more advanced imaging? I'm not going to talk about rare causes yet. And then the last thing I want to say here is the background is so helpful because we don't have a healthy, we have a young patient who has a renal trans transplant, is on immunosuppressive therapy. So now we have young patient, severely immunocompromised, who's here with hemoptysis. And you can even make more progress, ask the question, what type of immunocompromised state? How are these medications affecting the immune status? For example, prednisolone is something that we give to patients with liver disease. It's basically what we want prednisone to become to have its immunosuppressive effect, prednisolone. And that can compromise cell-mediated immunity. So you're at risk of fungal infections, but you can also be at risk of viral. It basically calms down the entire immune system. All that being said, um, Montez, is there anything else we should know about the HPI, like the degree of hemoptysis, any associated symptoms, and what has been the duration of this hemoptysis? Uh, this hemoptysis was uh, uh, going into mild to moderate uh, amounts and uh, has been pro uh, progressive with the patient for about two weeks with uh, uh, mild uh, shortness of breath uh, during exertion. Can we proceed to the examination? Yes, please. That's really helpful, Montez, because I think that the duration tells us that we're dealing with an acute to subacute process. You can imagine if this was a PE, yes, it could be indolent, but usually they'll present right away as you have an hyperacute vascular phenomenon. But yes, let's let's start with the vital signs and tell us the exam, my friend. Okay, for, for vital signs, the temperature is 37 centigrade, blood pressure 130 over 70, heart rate is 99. O2 set is 95% on room air. H-E-E-N-T was normal. Generally, slight pallor.
for cardiovascular, S1 and S2 with no murmurs. For chest examination, there is gynecomastia with right-sided localized crackles to the right upper zone with no other findings. For the abdomen, lax with no organomegaly. For the neurological examination, no neurological deficit has been detected. For extremities, no lower limb edema and no rash with no pathological patch or ecchymosis. That's the end of this alicot. Thank you, this is so helpful. Can I ask just a quick clarifying question, Moites? The tamoxifen, why is the patient on tamoxifen? And then um, can someone go, or maybe you can tell me, Montez, what is Baron Bucherev? The, the patient has been put on tamoxifen uh, and uh, steroid as a medication for treatment of his encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. That is super helpful um, because yeah, I, I actually have never heard of encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis, so I appreciate Yusef putting it in the chat. Thank you for that, Yusef. And it's good to know why patients are on the medications that they're on. And I have no shame in saying I had no idea that tamoxifen is a treatment option. But this explains why the patient has the gynecomastia, because ultimately gynecomastia is usually a reflection of too much estrogen compared to testosterone. And so that is not too concerning for me. Um, it's sort of expected. But remember where we started. We started that hemoptysis is either an alveolar problem or a vessel problem. This crackles takes us right to the alveoli. And it's really um, important to note that you can't have crackles from just atelectasis, but I think everything the momentum is saying when we get imaging on that right side, we're going to probably see some form of fluffy opacification, fluffy opacification. But the other parts of the exam are really helpful too. One is the pallor. The, you might think, well, why does this patient have pallor? You can definitely have hemoptysis to a degree where you develop anemia. And so I bet you the hemoglobin is gonna be less than nine or 10 in this patient, all stemming from the hemoptysis. The lack of petechiae or ecchymosis, it could tell us that the platelets are okay, but you don't wanna make that leap. You're gonna send platelets. That's not, it's not gonna be a reason not to send the platelet count or the PT or the PTT. So what this exam does for me, is it tells me there's something happening in that lung, in the alveoli. And I'm still going to check the coagulation cascade. I'm going to check the platelets. And based on the imaging, I'm going to be able to prioritize my DDX. But really where I am right now is I'm at either some kind of pneumonia, just doing base rate of disease. The patient is immunocompromised. They're not only at risk of these atypical infections that um, Yaz has taught us so much about, but they're at risk of common infections. So you got to worry about common infections uh, that may have a more prolonged course because of their immunocompromised state. But we'll see what the imaging shows. And I know I talked about capillaritis. The one vessel abnormality that can mimic alveolar process, because literally you're bleeding into alveoli, is diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Um, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So why don't we get some additional data, some labs and some baseline imaging? And then based on that, we'll be able to prioritize our DDX as to whether we're just dealing with run-of-the-mill uh, pneumonia, cancer, or 
if we're dealing with something more exotic, like vasculitis and bleeding into the alveoli causing diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Okay, for the uh, lab, uh, hemoglobin is 7.4. White so it was less than nine. I, I've redeemed myself. <laughs> Sh shall we proceed? Hello? Yes, please. Uh, yes, please. For hemoglobin is 7.4, white blood cell is 10.2 with normal differential. Bletlet count is 212, calcium is 2.3, phosphorus is 2.8, parathyroid level 63.7 picomole per liter, Bt TINR and BTT within normal range. Purified protein derivative test was negative. Quantifron test is negative. Echocardiography was normal right and left chambers diameters with normal left ventricular ejection fraction. <laughs> the patient had end stage kidney failure on regular hemodialysis for more than three years through the left catheter. He had a mild amount of hemoptysis on the start of hemodialysis that has occurred more than three times on the start of his hemodialysis. <clears throat> on revision of his system, no history of cough or fever no beta symptoms, no night fever, no night sweating, no loss of weight or appetite, no expectoration outside the hemodialysis, and cardiac symptoms, no chest pain or orthopnea or paroxysma nocturnal dyspnea, no palpitation, no syncope. Can we include chest X-ray now? Yes, please. Is it possible to share a screen? Yes. Yes. Let's make yes. you a course. Yes. And, and Motes, as you're bringing up the chest X-ray, can I ask you a question? The calcium. I just want to make sure. What's the normal level in your lab? From two point one to two point four. Oh, so this is normal calcium, basically. Yes. Okay. You should be able to share your screen now. Let me know if you have any difficulty. Um, Moatez, are you able to share your screen? Hello? Hello? Yes. Now, it, it is obvious or not? Uh, no, we can't see your screen right now. Uh -huh. Take your time. There you go. You're starting to share. Let's see. Here we are. Yes. Beautiful. I can take a quick crack at it and then you can maybe summarize what I miss. And looking at this right away, I'm going to do a hypothesis driven interpretation of the chest x-ray rather than 
be very systematic. You can see there the it seems like the dialysis line, if I'm not mistaken, here in the um in the in the major vein. What I'm surprised by is I, I'm not seeing that much in terms of opacification. Yes, on the right side, maybe I see some, you know, abnormality and some streaking, but not to the degree I was anticipating. So what this would prompt me to do, quite frankly, is to get a CT scan, because ultimately the chest x-ray is not that sensitive at analyzing the parenchyma. So in a patient like this, um, who is CKD, is on dialysis, if they're not making any urine, you might even consider just doing a contrast enhanced study to evaluate the vessels in addition to the alveoli, the lung parenchyma. But Montez, can you fill us in on the chest x-ray? What was the formal interpretation of this? Okay, before, before this, can we uh, share the previous one, previous chest x-ray? Oh, please. So Moites, are you pulling up the previous chest x-ray? Yes, yes. Oh, Give okay. me a second, please. Please, sure. It's difficult to be shared. Is that clear now? Um, I think it's still the one that you had shared. Okay, anyway, I think it is, I have some technical difficulty now. No problem. So, so we can proceed to the result of the CT. Okay, great. And what was the final, what was the interpretation of this Moates, this x-ray? The, the, uh, when we have revised the serial chest x-ray films for the patient, we have noticed that there is some migration of the tip of the dialysis line, migration of the tip okay. of the dialysis catheter, uh, to the degree that we have requested from the interventional radiologist, please go for uh, a contrast CT now. And the uh, CT has uh, concluded that there is migration, uh, migration of the catheter tip outside the venous walls. The CT has, has wow. proved that catheter tape traversing the wall of uh, subbureau vena cava, giving the picture of bronchocaval fistula. Wow. Okay. So let's get back to the whiteboard team. Let's, let's take over the whiteboard again so we can have the data in front of us. This is so fascinating. And it seems, um, <clears throat> Moetas, that if we start back at the beginning, we're dealing with subacute, acute to subacute hemoptysis in an immune compromised patient with um, a, a dialysis catheter that is migrating, creating uh, a fistula. So it is, it seems like it's the catheter itself as the etiology of the hemoptysis. If you did the CT scan with the contrast and you're not seeing a lot of junk in the parenchyma, and you're only seeing the catheter and you're having this fistula, it would be a very good explanation for what's going on with this patient. So my next steps would be speaking with the interventional radiologist. And I can't wait to hear from Moates, but what I think is so fascinating, nowhere on my DDX was catheter migration. I'm sure it's a rare phenomenon, but now that I know of this entity, it would make it into my problem representation going forward for the next patient. But Montes, maybe you can share with us what happened next. 
the patient has been consulted for the cardio thoracic surgeon and the patient underwent uh, uh, operative uh, thoracotomy with cardiopulmonary bypass for repair of uh, the venous wall due to the uh, difficulty has been uh, faced by the interventional radiologist to go by any catheter to try to repair this defect of the venous wall. I see. And, and can you tell us again what the fistula was? You, you used, well, what term was the fistula? What kind of fistula? A, a connection between the uh, venous wall and the right main bronchus that concluded to the uh, picture of the only uh, uh, trivial hemoptysis during the start and the use of the uh, catheter line uh, to the degree that the patient had uh, also uh, some sort of uh, shortness of breath during uh, exertion and it was uh, after this has been manipulated by operative sorocotomy uh, with repair of this defect. My mind is blown right now. I've never seen this before. I first want to just thank you, Montez, for bringing this case. Like you just and, gave, and, I mean, and I the, it, it was it was a very very you know, very rare also and the first time to be seen by our team also. And the main main trigger was the word triggered by your schema, Dr. Riza, that uh, the first to think regard the hemoptysis is to think about any connection between the parenchyma and the vasculature. Thank, thank you, Dr. Montez. Now I gotta call you doctor since you're calling me doctor. I, I, you know, I'm gonna pass you the mic to share any other teaching points you want and let us know how the patient did. Then we'll go to Ibrahim. But I just wanted to extend my thank you to you and the CP Solvers team. For really, I think bringing one of the most interesting cases I've ever had the luxury of discussing. Let us know how did the patient do? What do you want us as the learners to take away from this? And then we'll pass the mic to Ibrahim. The, the, any, any patient during dialysis had the difficulty to be uh, using his vascular access, especially the permanent catheters should be proceeded to the imaging first because this patient, we have manipulated him by thrombolytic therapy uh, uh, as, as a, a case of catheter malfunction. That is the usual, uh, usual uh, uh, management regarding any catheter malfunction to use thrombolytic therapy. But uh, at this time, after this thrombolytic therapy, the patient uh, developed this hemoptysis. And uh, if we know that this uh, complication can be expected in such a uh, case, we will not proceed for the thrombolytic therapy and the patient should be uh, underwent imaging and to, to, repair such, uh, to repair such defect between the main bronchus and the venous wall. Thank you so much, Dr. Montez. I wanna thank, um, Andrea for scribing, and um, I want to pass the mic to my dear friend Ibrahim to um, take it over, my friend. Uh, thank you all for this amazing case. Thank you to Prof, Prof Raz as well as Matez. Um, so this was a case of a patient who had hemoptysis, and if you encounter a patient with hemoptysis, the first thing you should be thinking about is the amount of hemoptysis that that patient is having. Uh, the reason for that is that if a patient is presenting with the mass of hemoptysis, uh, you may have to reverse their bleed, um, whether through embolization or cardiothoracic surgeon consultation. Um, and then if a patient is presenting with hemoptysis, the first test you should probably order is imaging. Um, the imaging is important because it can differentiate from the different etiologies that the patient might be presenting with. Um, so for example, a patient could be presenting with an alveolar etiology, whether it's pneumonia, cancer, or another mass effect. Um, and then they could also have something known as intrapulmonary shunting, secondary to whatever they're having in their alveoli. And so the imaging is gonna help you in actually positioning the patient um, at their past so that you can increase their oxygen saturation. Um, and then if a patient is presenting with bleeding per mouth, there is typically three different differentials that you have to consider, gastrointestinal versus autopharyngeal versus pulmonary, uh, pulmonary etiologies. And for this patient, um, we suspected that they had a, pul a pulmonary etiology. And so we dissected that further. 
If you approach a patient with pulmonary etiology of hemoptysis, you have to think about the level that that hemoptysis is originating from, um, whether it's alveolar or if it's from a vessel. And if it's from a vessel, you need to think about arteries versus capillaries uh, versus venules. Arteries would typically be the classical picture of a PE. Uh, capillaries would be either capillavitis or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. And it's important to, when you consider diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, to remember that it may mimic an alveolar process. Um, and venular process might be from backup pressure. So from whatever might cause increased pressure, um, including but, but, but not being limited to congestive heart failure. It's also important to differentiate hemoptysis from an infectious mimicker, such as Quran jelly, um, hemopt uh, uh, sorry, sputum. Um, and then you should also order CBC and coags, and you need to consider uh, platelet dysfunction in patients who might have CKD. And then the duration is also important in looking into patients with hemoptysis. If a patient is presenting acutely, you would start thinking about PE and other differentials if they're presenting subacutely. You should also consider immune status, such as this patient who is having prednisone, and as well as um, a, a picture of CKD, because this might actually clue, clue you into an infectious etiology of, atypical, of an atypical infection, as well as common etiologies. Um, and then if a patient is presenting on physical with clockers, you need to think about alveolar processes, and also you need to suspect fluffy opacification on imaging. If they're presenting with pallor, you need to think about anemia secondary to the hemoptysis. And if they have lack of petechiae, this may relate to normal platelets. However, you still have to opt to check CBC and coax. And then the last teaching point was from Dr. Martez, which is that if you have a patient who is presenting with, uh, if, if, if they're presenting with hemoptysis and they also have a catheter, you must approach them first with imaging because you might be suspecting catheter malfunction, just like this patient. Ibrahim, that was epic, my friend. Um, I love the way you structured the teaching points and you definitely added to the teaching points that were made during the case. So thank you for that. And um, I just wanted Shema to unmute herself and tell us about this weekend because there's a special VMR session. How can we join? What time is it at? And is it, in, is it in German? Is it in English? What language are we speaking on the weekend? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, hi. Uh, as you know, we have some German-speaking team members like Leah, Sammy, and also Anita and me, and it's all being organized by our amazing friend Maria. It will be a global German-Austrian VMR tomorrow at the usual time. I think it would be 9 a.m. PST, which would be in local German time, uh, 6 p.m. <laughs> and yes, tomorrow we will be discussing an amazing case presented by a friend. He's also in the chat. His name is Nicola. <laughs> and yeah, and we're so excited that um, to see you all join us. And yeah, and we'll also share um, about the uh, uh, you know about the clinical reasoning in Germany and Austria. And yes, we are so excited. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shema. All right, everyone. Thanks for an awesome Friday. We will see you tomorrow where we're going to try to solve a case in German, which I'm really excited about. I'll see you tomorrow, Shema. Bye, everyone.